cancer. Sometimes when we think about cancer, we it, it's it's a mysterious, scary concept because it is our own DNA. It's not an infection. There's a mutation in the base pairs. We call these genes in the um, twisted helix uh, that's in every nucleus of our body. Now hyperplasia is just an early stage and it's just cells dividing. It can be benign, that means harmless. Uh, like in the skin, sometimes in the dermal layers there's some skin, rep uh, skin cell replication. We don't worry about it. But some tissues, the cells divide so rapidly. Like I think of the colon, the lining of the colon, uterus, liver, some cells, look at that, isn't that wild? Oh, there's a, okay, right there, there's a benign cyst to the right. Okay. Pretty good view of it off to the right. Okay, I don't want to mess with it too much. All right. So let's look at this. We have the disruption of DNA here. We have hyperplasia, just cells dividing. Nothing serious yet. Dysplasia is the next stage. And here, we're starting to see maybe some abnormal activity. We may still call it stage zero in terms of cancer, but depending on where it is. I mentioned the colon, but also the uterus, the cervix especially. Rapid cell division. If we see dysplasia occurring in the cervix, uh, okay, it's not cancer, but we don't walk away from it. We're likely to deal with it immediately because cell division is so rapidly uh, going on that we can hit malignancy you know, months later. All right. So it's preventative. Go in there and do something about it. A pap smear is a technique where a speculum is inserted in the vagina to kind of spread that the tissue apart so that a small brush can go in there and collect um, the cervical cells from the surface. Now we may have what is called atypical squamous, which it's undetermined, right? We don't know what's going on. And when we don't know what's going on in the cervix, we have to uh, send it to a lab and, and, and see if it's a adenocarcinoma or in the glandular tissue, something we need to worry about. Now, I don't want to scare people because it takes several years for cervical cancer to develop. And that's one of the reasons we get testing, especially at a certain age, every three years. Uh, it depends, you know, family history, your history, uh, and other factors will determine this frequency. In situ is when it's in the place of origin, which means it has not uh, metastasized, hasn't moved yet. And that's, that's a good time to catch it because surgically this can be uh, removed and we're done. I mentioned that benign is, the word means harmless, but we still have to consider these because these benign tumors can press on uh, organs and block channels and eventually become a problem. Lipomas, this is a fatty deposit you will see on uh, people sometimes. Uh, I have I have one myself. Uh, fibroids, fairly common. And these are uh, tumors that we watch and monitor. Maybe not, we don't go in there and remove them immediately. But polyps, okay, we're back to this dysplasia. Um, if we have rapid cell division occurring in this tissue and then we see a polyp, then the potential for it to metastasize and become cancerous is high. I like colonoscopies, all right? In my last colonoscopy, I asked to be uh, awake, all right? So I could see the uh, process. It's fascinating. A gastroenterologist is the expert that um, guides the camera and the tube, but I like this technique because it's also preventative. There's a, a snipping tool or a loop where the uh, polyp, if it's seen, can be removed. And, it, and they go all the way to the cecum here. Now, there are cheap, easy tests like the fecal immunochemical, the occult blood test. 
uh, I, I, I don't recommend those unless, um, unless a person just cannot undergo the colonoscopy. Another strategy is a sigmoidoscopy. So in a sigmoidoscopy down here, you see about two feet of the lower um, colon. And this is often where troubles are anyway. We do this because you know, some patients have um, Crohn's disease or uh, diverticulitis, or as we get older, the colon uh, is going to stiffen. But I've dissected many human bodies, and man, I, I'm impressed by how tough this colon is. So perforation is unlikely, I'll tell you that. Now we're to the malignant story, which is not a happy one, because here we have this process called angiogenesis. I like this word, because genesis means the beginning. Angio means uh, blood vessel, it can mean that. And what's happening here is cancer cells, they, they need a, a steady blood supply, man, they're hungry. And they do that with these pro angiogenic factors. And I'm talking about things like VEGF, EGF, okay, and I have them described down here, vascular endothelial growth factors, epidermal growth factors. Here we go. We can see this, all right, and this is normal, but oh, here's a growth factor. And this growth factor, when it binds, is going to stimulate the blood vessel to grow tumor. Okay, that, that tumor is going to redirect our own blood vessels so that the tumor gets fed. Wow, man, that is key stuff. So the tumor is taking care of itself hmm, by uh, producing these blood vessels. Now, a, pro, a proto oncogene is a good guy. So, so let's get that straight. We've got some vocab to learn here. The proto-oncogene is going to tell the cell to go through ap apoptosis. And, and th this is cell death. That happens and something's wrong with that cell. We want to get rid of it. Now here we have this human epidermal growth factor, a video going on, because breast cancer is uh, influenced by HER2. Now take a look. Okay, here's a breast tissue. And we're going to have too many receptor sites on the cells. Let's see if we can get this where we want to see it. Yeah. Right right here. Okay. Because then when the growth factors are in the bloodstream and they bind these receptors, now the cell is going to go crazy and divide and now we have an oncogene which can become cancerous and so these re these um, growth factors are important for the uh, development of a cancer fortunately uh, there's some good time parts of the story because we may have oncogenes but we have tumor suppressor genes thank goodness and what these do is they're going to get, uh, do that apoptosis. And that is cell death. They're saying, hey, hey, baby, something is wrong with you. Your, your DNA is messed up. And I'm sorry, but you're going to die. And, and that's what tumor suppressor genes do. They kill. And this happens a lot at night. So a good reason to get a good night's sleep is because while you're sleeping, it's the silent storm. People call it the silent storm because... While you're sleeping, there is polymerase that's repairing this. And tumor suppressor genes are, are sending in proteins, and they're mending our DNA. But you got to get good sleep, right? Quality sleep. Yeah, no alcohol before bed, no sleep aids, just good deep stage four sleep. All right. Um, if the suppressor genes are dysfunctional, this is a loss of function, and then we have mutations. And so I like this little story, like the um, oncogenes, they're like a car, okay? The oncogene is going to say, hey, man, make lots of cells, divide like crazy, and that's cancer, right? 
But the tumor suppressor says, whoa, man, hit the brakes. You're making too many cells. And so you can see the tumor suppressor genes have an important role in, in keeping us from being cancerous. But sometimes something goes wrong. As in the BRCA1 and 2, these are on chromosome 17 and 13. Now, breast cancer, men get it too, right? We're not just talking women. And if you have this mutation, you can see it could be dangerous. Now, we might get one at birth that's inherited, and then we may acquire one later in life. And this is the danger of, I, I talked about smoking at the beginning. You don't know which genes are dysfunctional when you're born. And so one person may smoke for 50 years, but they have no dysfunctional genes for that particular uh, carcinogen. But what if you're born with an oncogene that's susceptible to uh, cigarette smoke? Then it won't take much for you to suffer from uh, you know, lung cancer. All right, so we don't know what we're born with. Now, there are factors such as radiation, tobacco, a diet, and some hormones. I'll talk about that. And so during our lifetime, we can uh, damage our DNA. And so we have an inherited one, and now we have one that we are acquired, and we're in trouble. Okay. And that is why some people will have this process done. Ophorectomy, says Angelina, because if you have the inactive BRCA, that means you, you don't have that tumor suppression ability. So if there is a problem with DNA, you don't suppress it. And so cancer sets in. And this is a problem, especially for women. Okay, men get breast cancer but women who have menopause like after 45 their um you know their estrogen drops off egg release stops and many women don't like what happens afterwards because it's not just about being like tired um, you know, fatigue hot flashes but uh, sometimes masculine features like the voice changes and and so if a woman wants to go on hormone replacement therapy take on some estrogen or progesterone then um, she has to be aware of her BRCA if these suppressor genes are working the risk is low but if she has family history or she gets tested then um, then they got to decide okay I'm at risk so if I'm going to do uh, hormone replacement therapy um, I'm at risk it, or, you know, I, this is a little bit radical to have mastectomy, double mastectomy done, but uh, breast cancer is a scary uh, situation. So everyone has to make their own decision. All right. Thanks for listening.